Hi, I'm Dr. John Cavanaugh, and welcome to AJS 101, Introduction to Criminal Justice, Lesson 2, Part 1. Let's talk about the crime picture. Now, when we talk about crime, it is important to remember that the crime statistics are mere numbers, but that behind each number is a victim who's a human being, and behind each murder victim are grieving friends and relatives. As statistics can never capture the human side of the tragedy of crime. So it's important not to forget about the humanity and the misery uh, and just get buried in cold numbers and statistics. So why do we collect crime statistics? Well, one reason is to tell how much crime there is and trends. How much crime there is is important because uh, we want to know, you know, if we're doing a good job or a bad job, if things are getting better or things are getting worse, uh, how many police to deploy, how many judges and jails and prisons that we need. But we also want to track trends. Uh, is crime going up or going down? But trends aren't always up and down. We might also look for shifts in crime. If the police do a crackdown in one neighborhood, Criminals may not reform. Instead, they may shift to a different neighborhood. So you also want to track the trends of the way crimes travel or the way criminals move from one type of crime to another. So crime statistics help us get a handle on that type of activity. Now, crime statistics also help in the development and the evaluation of programs. Uh, the federal government, private foundations, uh, even private companies and individuals spend a lot of money developing programs to combat crime. Uh, it may be a program designed for rehabilitation, it may be an enforcement program, but a lot of money is spent to try to reduce crime. But how do you know if the program worked? If you spent a lot of money and you, didn't, you don't know if it made things better or worse, then you may have wasted money or you may not have wasted money, you don't know. Uh, and worse yet, if you spent a lot of money on a program that's horrible, uh, you wouldn't want other people to go down the road and duplicate that waste of money. So when the federal government or even foundations give governments grants or private groups grants to uh, create programs to reduce crime, part of the grant is often a requirement that they evaluate the effectiveness of the program. And what that means is they have to develop measures of success and they have these measures of course have to be measurable you, you can't have subjective vague things instead you have to have actual measures the number of uh, arrests the number of crime reports uh, these are types of measures you can use and you also have to determine before you start the program what would the measure of success be you can't wait until after the program is completed and the stats are in and then look and figure out if you want to call it a success or not. It's too easy for people who uh, back the program to become biased and claim it's a success. So beforehand you say, if we reduce crime by this much or, or whatever parameter you're using, the program is a success. If it isn't, it's not a success. Another reason why we collect crime statistics is to help in understanding the nature and the causes of crime. The ultimate goal of social science is not just to understand a social phenomenon like crime, but to determine what causes it. Because once you understand the causes of crime, then you might be able to institute programs uh, that will eliminate those causes and thus eliminate the crime. So causality is an important uh, factor and something which we strive for when we, when we try to fight crime. And by the way, there are many causes of crime. Human behavior is an extremely complex phenomenon. People aren't affected usually by one thing or another. Normally, there are a host of factors, factors related to the individual, factors related to the people and society around him. Uh, they're sociological, they're psychological, they're economic factors. So in the real world, human behavior is multivariate. And usually, if you just study one factor, uh, to try to determine if it's causing something, you'll fail because many things work together to, to, to influence people. And some things influence some people and not other people. So that kind of research is, is very difficult to conduct. <clears throat> uh, another reason why we collect crime statistics is to develop 
and change programs. As I said before, if we want to reduce robberies in an area, sex crimes, uh, uh, battery, uh, domestic violence, hate crimes, you have to understand uh, where they're occurring, who, who is committing those crimes, uh, when are they being committed, uh, what are the factors that correlate with the commission. And when you have those that information, then you can develop a program that you think might reduce the problem. Uh, so we develop and change programs. As we do a program, we, we collect statistics because the statistics may say that the program helped a little bit, but not that much. And the data might help us not throw the program out, but change the program, make some modifications to it that might make it a very successful program. And the final purpose of crime statistics is to distribute money. The federal government distributes a lot of money. The state governments, local governments distribute a lot of money for law enforcement. Uh, we talk about the police, uh, money goes to the courts, money goes to corrections. And if you don't know how much crime there is, how many criminals there are, the, the, the length of trials, incarceration rates, then you can't budget money to the different groups so they can do an adequate job for what they're trying to do. Now, let's talk about how much crime is reported. Nobody really knows exactly how much crime occurs in the U.S. or anywhere for that matter, because not all crimes that are committed are discovered. And we can visualize this by looking at the pyramid of crime. Uh, that's drawn here on the bottom of the slide. So if we envisioned all crime inside the pyramid, on the very bottom layer, we have crime that is not discovered. Crime that's not discovered is obviously not known to anybody. Uh, it's not known to the police because nobody knows that it occurred other than the perpetrator. Now you may say, well, how could this be? Well, this might be a situation where uh, you're sitting in the cafeteria and uh, your handbag is open and your wallet is inside and you've got maybe $40 in it, mixed bills and you get up to leave uh, to go to the restroom and in the five minutes that you're gone somebody sitting nearby walks over to your handbag opens your wallet takes out ten of the forty dollars and then goes back to the seat you go back to your uh, table and you don't realize anything occurred and you never missed that ten dollars that was a crime that occurred but was not discovered uh, maybe you cut somebody off while you were driving and they were upset and they followed you and you parked your car in a parking lot and you went into a store and then while you were gone they purposely backed their car into your car denting your door and drove away. You come out and you think it was an accident that somebody just left the scene of. Uh, you didn't realize that it was actually a criminal act called criminal mischief. Uh, so those would be two examples, and there are many more, of crimes that occur but are not discovered. However, not all crimes that are discovered are reported. And that's the next level, discovered but not reported crimes. Uh, sometimes people are the victims of a crime. They realize they're crime victims, but they do not call the police. There may be a lot of reasons for this. The perpetrator may have threatened them. Uh, and they're afraid that if they report the crime, the perpetrator will do worse things to them. Maybe the crime occurred while they were committing a criminal act. Maybe they were buying drugs from a drug dealer and the drug dealer ripped them off. So is this person going to go to the police and say, hey, I want to report a robbery while I was buying drugs illegally, this guy robbed me? No, people like that will often just uh, forget about it and, and walk away. So obviously, uh, or the person might be an Ill illegal immigrant and is afraid of apprehension. So there are many reasons why a person who's a crime victim will not report the crime to the police. And those crimes that are not reported, they're discovered but not reported, they don't make it into the crime statistics. <clears throat> and not all reported crimes are officially recorded. Just because you report a crime to the police does not necessarily mean that the police are going to record it on an official crime report. Uh, and there can be a number of reasons for this. Uh, one of the most common reasons is, is that the police do not believe that it is a legitimate crime report. 
when I was a uh, police officer, uh, especially when I was a uniformed sergeant at the bus terminal in Times Square, uh, there were a lot of homeless people and mentally ill people who were living and hanging out in the bus terminal. And if I was the desk sergeant, sometimes they would come in and they would want to report a crime. And sometimes uh, it became very apparent that they didn't, they were not crime victims, but they were just delusional. Now, sometimes people who are mentally ill are crime victims, and that's tragic. But sometimes when you listen to the story, it becomes more and more incredible, and you realize that this is a delusional situation. That's a situation where the crime, in quotes, is reported, but the police will not make an official report about it. Uh, there are other reasons also. It could be a lazy cop who doesn't want to do the paperwork. Uh, another possible reason might be uh, that sometimes crimes are under-recorded. Uh, this is a, a scandal in some police departments. Uh, this may be a situation where the police are under pressure to reduce, say, robberies. And the unofficial word goes out that when they get a robbery complaint, they should do the report not as a robbery, which is a serious felony, but a larceny, which is either a misdemeanor or a low-grade felony. So they misrecord the crimes to reduce their robbery stats. Uh, so that would be another example of crime that is reported to the police, but in this case, not properly recorded. And finally, the Uniform Crime Report does not record all crimes. It only records the most serious crime committed in each incident. So let me explain that uh, a little bit. Uh, in many criminal situations, numerous crimes are committed, uh, uh, but they're not all put into the stats. Only the most serious crime makes the Uniform Crime Report statistics. Let me give you an example. Uh, once when I was on patrol in the bus terminal as a police officer, I received a radio call uh, from our lieutenant, and this was a midnight to us, so this was around two, three in the morning, that he was observing a male uh, on the upper parking levels of the bus terminal, looking into cars. Well, this individual uh, was looking into cars. He tried a few door handles to see if the car was unlocked. Eventually, he broke the antenna off of the car and used it to uh, insert it into the window and open up the car by flipping a little latch. And this is back in the 70s where you could do that with cars. You could open the in indoor doorknobs with wires. Uh, he then went into the car, he pried, uh, he was trying to pry open the radio, he stole some change, uh, and then the lieutenant confronted him, and he attacked the lieutenant. Uh, the lieutenant, of course, called on the radio, we all responded, I made the arrest. Now, this is a situation where this individual committed many crimes in this one incident. Uh, he was in an area where only people who had cars parked could be, so he was guilty of criminal trespass. When he was walking around uh, trying to open the car doors, uh, that was criminal tampering. When he broke off the antenna from the motor vehicle, that was criminal mischief, destruction of property. Uh, when he entered the car, that became unauthorized use of a motor vehicle. When he pried the radio uh, out of the car, that was more criminal tampering because he damaged the vehicle. It was also larceny because he stole from the vehicle. He stole some change, another larceny uh, um, violation. When the lieutenant confronted him uh, to arrest him, he resisted arrest physically. That's resisting arrest. And he punched the lieutenant, injuring him. That's felony assault on a police officer. So this one individual committed an, an entire litany of crimes. However, only the most serious one, the felony assault on a police officer, made the uniform crime report. And that's true for a lot of criminal incidents. Although there are some exceptions, like uh, rape, even if it's not the most serious crime, is uh, usually reported in, in the crime report also. Because some crimes we are especially diligent in wanting to um, pursue. So as I said, uh, UCR doesn't get to crimes that aren't discovered, doesn't get to crimes that aren't reported, doesn't get to crimes that are not recorded by the police. And even when the police make a report, the crime stats that we see do not contain all the crimes committed, but only for the most part, the most serious crime. 
So that's the severe limitation of the Uniform Crime Report. Now, the Uniform Crime Report is compiled by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, from data submitted by over 16,000 police departments in the United States. The UCR, as it's referred to, relies on crimes reported to the police and recorded by the police. And again, only the most serious incident usually gets into the stats. The UCR is the major source of crime information in the nation. When you read it on, on the newspapers and on TV about crime is up, crime is down, uh, normally that's coming from the Uniform Crime Report. Now, let's talk about Uniform Crime Report terminology. Uh, there are Part 1 offenses and there are Part 2 offenses. The Part 1 offenses are the major crimes like murder, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, and motor vehicle theft. And we call these index crimes because the FBI uses them to construct an index figure to track crime. Part 1 offenses are used in the index because they are more reliably reported. So remember, the Part 1 offenses are the ones we use to track crime. Is it up? Is it down? What area has more crime than other areas? And we use these crimes because more serious crimes are more highly reported. So they're more reliable. Uh, and again, these are all serious crimes except for motor vehicle theft. And motor vehicle theft is included in the Part 1 offenses, not because it's a very serious crime, but it is an extremely well-reported crime. If your car is stolen, you most always have to report it to the police for insurance purposes, to account for the license plate you can't return to motor vehicles. So those are the Part 1 offenses. And again, they're used to track crime and trends and numbers and rates. Two other major categories of crime used in the Uniform Crime Report are violent crimes and property crimes. This is a very important bifurcation. Uh, I think most people are more concerned about trends in violent crime because that's what affects them in their lives, that's what they worry about. So we break out violent crimes separately from property crimes. The FBI, the FBI also constructs a crime clock which tells how frequently different crimes occur. Now, a crime clock is a statistical descriptive tool. There are many different ways to portray or uh, tell people about statistics. Uh, one way is to put it in a table, but that's kind of dry and hard to read. Uh, sometimes you'll see a bar graphs, and that's a visual depiction, which uh, gives you a different way of looking at the stats. You might see a pie chart, that's another visual description. Uh, and if you look at the stats in different ways, it, it allows your mind to get different perspectives on it, and it enhances your understanding by using multiple descriptors of, of events and statistics. The crime clock is a very novel visual depiction of crime. Uh, what the crime clock is, is it tells how frequently different crimes occur. So they will take the total number of murders committed in the United States and they will divide that by the number of minutes in a year. And they'll be able to say uh, every, uh, a murder is committed every 13 minutes. Uh, a rape is committed every uh, three hours. Right? Uh, a larceny is committed every two seconds. Right? So by taking the total number of crimes committed, and figuring out over the course of a year uh, how uh, dividing the, the number of crimes by seconds, hours, or days, you find out how many uh, of such crimes occur every, every day, every hour, every minute. And it gives you an idea about the frequency of the crimes. So that's uh, an interesting descriptor. Now, the UCR reports data in two ways. The first way is as raw numbers. And raw numbers is the actual count. So, for instance, there were, I'll be hypothetical here, but let's talk about a, a city. Uh, let's say that there were uh, 6,712 robberies in that city, right? That is the raw number. However, the UCR also reports the robberies as rates. And rates are the number of crimes per thousand people, or it could be per hundred thousand people. The, the, the base is sometimes different but it's number of crimes per so many people. 
So let's, for instance, say number of crimes per uh, 1,000 people. So there may be 6,312 robberies, uh, but the rate might be uh, 6.23 robberies per 1,000 people. And the reason why you want to use rates is because it allows for comparisons across time and between different locations at the same time. Uh, it would not be fair to compare the murder rate in, say, Phoenix with the murder rate in New York City. Because New York City, you know, has 8 million people living there and Phoenix has uh, perhaps uh, a little over a million. So if you did the raw numbers, no matter what, Phoenix would look extremely safe and New York would look extremely dangerous. Because the numbers alone, uh, the populations are so different. So the way that you can do a reasonable comparison between two areas with different populations is to compute, use not the raw number of robberies, but the number of robberies per 1,000 residents. That controls the population, and then you can truly see which city is safer in terms of robberies, at least. Uh, finally, there is the clearance rate. The clearance rate for crimes is the percent, what do you think? solved. But note how the operational definition of solved is by arrest or other, and other can mean that the police think they know who did it, but the suspect is dead or there's not enough evidence to arrest. Uh, also, if the defendant is found not guilty, the case is still kept cleared. So the clearance rate is a highly misleading statistic. You know, most people think clearance means they found the guilty person and he or she was convicted. <clears throat> Again, that's not the case. If an arrest is made, the crime is cleared, even if the person is found not guilty. If they can't find the person, but they think they know who it is, or they think the person is dead, they could clear the crime. Uh, one of the big abuses uh, in clearance, rate, uh, clearance rates is by claiming you think you know who did it, based upon their modus operandi, but you can't link them to specific crimes. Let me give you an example. And this is how some police departments artificially increase their clearance rate to make it look like they're being more effective in apprehending criminals. Let's say that uh, there is a criminal who is uh, burglarizing homes in the daytime. And this criminal has a very unique modus operandi. Prize open, sliding glass patio doors, only steals stereo equipment, <clears throat> goes into the refrigerator and steals beer if there is beer there, um, and then leaves. So let's say that this person has committed, that there have been oh, 15 or 20 uh, robberies of uh, homes with patio doors over the last six months. And the police suddenly catch somebody. Well, they can't really be that sure that the person committed all the other burglaries. Uh, maybe if in each other one there was a patio door, only electronics and food was stolen, it might be reasonable to claim that this person committed all of them. But they certainly couldn't arrest the person for all of them. However, if the police want to increase their clearance rate, they will not only clear the other burglaries with the identical M.O., of the patio door, the stereo equipment, and the, and the beer from the refrigerator, they'll, if they have other burglaries of uh, patio home entries that didn't have electronic equipment but other stuff stolen and there was no beer taken, they might also claim that this person did them, even though they're not arresting him, and clear all of those burglaries. So that is an abuse of the clearance rate. So when you hear clearance rate, you've got to be kind of suspicious uh, because it's kind of a... Uh, easily fudgeable statistic. Okay, that concludes lesson two, part one. So next you'll go to lesson two, part two, and I will see you there.